Welcome back to Introduction to Agroecology, Unit 10, um, Section 2, the second unit of Unit 10, second chapter, I guess, in Understanding Human Interference in uh, Plant and Animal Selection and Genetics. Um, we're going to start talking in this unit about GMO crops that are currently in use. And pretty much if you look at it, it's just about everything of the major crops, certainly corn, wheat, soybeans, rice, cotton, canola seed, sugar beets, which is used for sh creating sugar, making sugar, um, lettuce, peanuts, tomatoes, and potatoes um, are the major ones that currently have, in other words, all that genetically modified pieces. Um, here's just showing in a graph of looking at the other types or the same types of things of the major crops of corn, um, cotton, and soybeans. And the um, BT corn is the stuff that is able to have resistance to, in other words, uh, you can put Roundup on it and it will not kill the soybeans. It used to be, if anyone's used Roundup, Roundup kills anything that it touches, any plant, any living organism of a plant. Um, this they built up or, or created a way that it will not kill the corn or soybeans. Um, here's just an example of, uh, and I thought it was a pretty picture of canola seed. Um, that they have and interestingly looking at it, it's in a hilly area and you can see there's areas of trees and in fact there's an area of a tree right here that uh, canolas are growing right up around it. So an interesting way different than what we do and see normally in most crops today. Um, just some general information on GMO crops. Um, there's about 200 million acres. Uh, hectares are listed there. Also, if you like to do it in metric, but 200 million acres, that's quite a bit. When you consider a um, square mile is 640 acres, so it's quite a few uh, square miles that we have in that. Um, pretty much the company Monsanto has cornered most of the market on GMO crops. And they have or own with the different varieties they own or different companies they bought out 80 to 90 percent of the market in terms of the crops we mentioned on the first slide. Um, why were GMO plants uh, created? To have better pest resistance? I mean the whole idea was it didn't quite turn out as, as they thought but this is what the idea was. Pest resistance, uh, increased nutrition of the food that you get. In other words when you eat it you get better better nutrition out of it more vitamins, those types of things. Um, resistance to herbicides, uh, you could put on Roundup, they've developed that, but they've got the super weeds now. And then it has been uh, commercially available from the early 90s. One of the biggest issues with the GMO crops is, and part of the issue is, uh, there's been big things go to the Supreme Court of uh, farmers trying to use their own soybeans and they couldn't because the pollination from and they had genetic traits of the Monsanto stuff so now farmers can't even use their own soybeans which is how most of them planted it up to about 10 years ago. Um, what are the effects or issues uh, on food safety? Uh, transgenic rice is cross-pollinated with wild rice um, and it's affecting the non-target organisms. Um, we're getting accelerated uh, pesticide um, resistance. In other words, the because there isn't the natural selection, the pests find a way to resist it quicker. And then there's toxic agents and allergens that were introduced into the food supplies through the plants or animals eating them. A lot of research going on right now. Is all of this good or bad? Um, the jury's kind of still out on it, um, but there's some people very much believe that it's we shouldn't eat any GMO foods. Um, there are some that believe, well, there might be some change, but we just have to look and see what it is and what we have to worry about. Um, are we having this stuff? Is it harmful to wildlife and some of the beneficial uh, species? 
Some beneficial insects have been killed off because of GMO crops. Some of the pollinators have gone away, and then it, it has affected some of the birds and the animals. So that's one of the things they're doing research on. Um, some of the pollution that you have, genetic pollution of the environment. Um, sometimes the genes jump from this plant to some of the native species that didn't even have those characteristics. So some are believing that's genetic pollution. Um, and sometimes there's no predictable consequence for the environment, that super weed creation that we talked about. They didn't envision it. They didn't see it when they were first creating it. That might mean that we're not testing stuff long enough to really see the long-term effect. One of the big, big, big um, problems with GMO is uh, have we seen enough of it to really know for sure? Um, certainly we're losing genetic diversity because we're getting um, the local ecosystems because we're all using the same, the few, 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 let's say corn or soybean, whatever it is we're planting in an area that we're changing the whole scale of what that genetic diversity is. <clears throat> um, natural selection has been certainly reduced and in some places it's becoming common just to have one genetic line. And as we go on, that's one of the fears that we'll have just one line and not many in case we'd have some kind of type of disaster. Um, current information, we have 300,000 edible plant species. 60% uh, of the crops come from four different plants. Okay, so in other words, of all the crops out here, of the 300,000 species, 60% of them come from just four different plants. Wheat, rice, corn, and potatoes. And you can see the different varieties on corn. We're down to six different varieties. Um, where 71% of that crop is from those six varieties, okay? Um, and you can see the, 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 on wheat there's a few more varieties. The reason there's on some of these there's more varieties is because there's more variation in the different areas that they grow that they have different qualities that they'd want. But if you look at potatoes, that's the most alarming one. There's two varieties of potatoes out there um, that make up 95% of the crop. Um, we've been losing genetic diversity over time. One example is apple varieties. Um, there were 6,000 known varieties in 1900. 86% um, of them, excuse me, I'm reading that wrong. Since 1900, 6,000 varieties of apples are not there. Okay, that's where we know for sure 86% of what we had back in 1900 doesn't exist anymore. Uh, milk, 70% of our milk is produced by one breed of dairy cow, Holstein. There are probably six, eight variety or, or breeds of dairy cows. Holstein, the black and white ones, um, make up 70% of that. I've already mentioned before that 90% of the eggs that are produced are from one variety and that's white leghorns. Um, what we're some of the estimates and estimates are just that. Somebody sits there behind a desk and tries to decide, but 28 to 43 percent of the animal, animal breeds out there are in danger of extinction. And what that means, it's just like when we had the problems with the eagles, the, the skin of the, or the eggs, the shell was getting too thin, and then when the eagle would sit on it, and it was any bird of prey actually, it wasn't just the eagle. Um, would sit on their egg and crush it so their population was going down because they would only produce so many eggs a year for new for new babies so they weren't getting the babies um, and they were able to um, reverse that by getting rid of uh, what was causing that. Um, but basically when it gets down to a certain point it could become extinct because there aren't enough to keep reproducing. Uh, if you put all of one breed on one island eventually those animals wouldn't be there. They'd eventually have a not, not have enough diversity, possibly not enough food, and there wouldn't be any animals after a certain amount of time. Um, during the 20th century, 75% um, of plant genetic diversity was lost because farmers started adopting that uniform high yield varieties. In other words, they wanted better, better, better crops, so they're going to the hybrids, and 75% of what they used to have 
at the beginning of the 20th century wasn't there after the 20th century. Um, When we lose diversity, because you have fewer animals to pick from, um, the future breeding efforts are going to become more restrictive. In other words, if you had 10 types of breeds of a certain animal, and now you have three, you aren't going to be able to create as many traits because of that. Um, Loss of plants and animals in an area, having adapted to environmental changes because we're coming out with just certain ones, that's all you're going to have. They aren't going to keep adapting because of that because we keep coming out with the new um, characteristics and breeds. Um, A broader genetic base provides for greater resistance to disease uh, or attacks in an area. Um, total crop loss or herd decimation. In other words, the more you have, the more they're able to resist whatever would hit an area. And if you don't have that variety, you could lose uh, more animals and plants in a quicker way. Um, It's possible to have greater chance for resistance um, if you carry particular genes and Diversity has always ensured that enough traits are there to satisfy the needs we have um, for those organic foods if we have the diversity. If we don't have that, you're not going to have those choices. It's all going to be hybrid. That is not what organic would be. Organic are the open pollinated. or In other words, they haven't been genetically modified. Um, <clears throat> if we lose it, you also... Um, if we, if we, I should say, if we have it, we have uh, long-term flexibility to adapt to whatever environmental conditions we have, and those are constantly changing. Um, gene banks have been created when farmers, uh, geneticists, and plant breeders started seeing issues and decided to be proactive. In other words, when they started getting rid of certain characteristics, they would save the appropriate genes so that they could come back and get those in the future if they needed to. They weren't doing that in the past. Now all of a sudden they decided, whoops, it's affecting the environment. Maybe we should save some of those things. We might need them in the future. Um, If we get too uniform in the crops that we have, we found that it allows for us being susceptible to more pests, diseases, If the weather changes outside the realms of what we have bred crops to be, that or animals for that matter, um, we might not have as many because we'd lose them based on the weather being outside of those parameters. Um, For this uniformity in in the crops, um, you have to focus on certain characteristics. And when you do that, it's going to narrow the diversity of what you have in those crops. In other words, you're going to be more susceptible to the different things. Here's an example of an urban garden where they're using just open pollinated varieties. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to get um, help to get more acclimated to the environments that they're in so that if there are changing conditions that they will be able to adapt like we'd like them to. Um, Some of the vulnerability um, that you have an increased risk of attack by pests or diseases. Uh, You have a more uniform crop or herd in an area. When the um, problem happens, the more loss you're going to have. Um, pests will adapt quickly when they see that environment because everything's the same. It's easier for them to pinpoint what's not, what's vulnerable and be able to adapt and, and attack. They're trying to live too. That's what it's all about. That, that natural selection when we had that kept that from happening at such a high rate. It took the pests longer to be able to adapt because there were so many different varieties and types. Um, And just about all pesticides and antibiotics have been overcome. Just like in humans, as an example, penicillin, a lot of the uh, human race, penicillin no longer does anything. Back in the 40s and 50s when uh, it first came out, it was the thing that helped you get over a lot of different diseases. Today, not so much. We have a lot of different medicines. Um, Weather changes help spread 
um, because you have vectors that vectors are ways in which a disease or a pest will take something from one area and and move it to the other. If we have genetic vulnerability, as an example, the Irish potato famine um, back in the mid 1800s. Um, Half of the potato crop was infested with a fungus, that late blight fungus. It became a widespread famine because a quarter of the population was forced to emigrate because there wasn't enough food there. Why did they have the potato blight? Because Irish farmers used just two varieties of potatoes for over 300 years. So over time, the fungus got to a point where it was better than the plants and it started wiping everything out. Um, interestingly, um, they had the same thing over in South America, the same blight hit over there, but because they had a diversity of the different types of potatoes that they planted, it wasn't a problem and that resistance developed naturally. In other words, it wasn't a huge issue in wiping out uh, most of the crop. Um, for vulnerability, well, a lot of people believe the issue is clear. We need to change what we're doing. We need to get away from as many genetically modified organisms. We need to get more diversity. Otherwise, we're going to have larger famines and more problems with those fewer varieties. Um, the greater number of varieties we have, the fewer problems we're going to see in the long term. Um, increased dependence on human interaction. Um, the human interactions are those um, items that Humans have to do it, otherwise the plants or animals aren't going to survive. Uh, in this case, we're applying the synthetic fertilizers and pesticides. Um, we, Because of that, it's almost necessary to do that to keep the crops producing. Um, we cannot produce anything from seed because everything's hybrid now. It's not open pollinated. Um, soil amendments are necessary because the nutrients aren't there because of the way in which we grow crops. We need to look at changing that. And then in a lot of cases, especially with vegetables and fruits, that we need to irrigate in order to be able to um, raise a crop in that particular region, specifically in warmer regions <coughs> that have less water supplies. Um, loss of other genetic resources. It's important that we have diversity in organisms. We talked about that for the spread of pests and diseases. Um, we need a wild relative of crops to provide new variety. In other words, something that isn't there that will help get us more diverse. Um, we need to have minor varieties of crops. We need some annual crops. And then we need to find a way to get the um, beneficial organisms uh, back into the uh, ground, trees, soils, and the other organisms. Um, we need to breed things for durable resistance, and that basically means that um, we're going to change um, one element at a time. We aren't going to try to change multiple things. They found out in terms of doing that that they were they might gain one, but they lost something else. So we're trying to see. If we get just one thing and then add something else, will it get better resistance as we, we go along? Um, we're also looking to change uh, the whole environment, all the different factors that we have. They call that horizontal resistance. Um, what we're finding out that it's generally best to use open pollinated land races. Land races are those things that have adapted in that area. In other words, you aren't going to take a seed that you grew in New York and try to use it in Illinois. You're going to take seed that was created in Illinois and use it in Illinois, New York and New York, that type of thing uh, for the area. It might even be more specific than, you know, Illinois or New York. It might be smaller areas also based on what the environment's like and conditions are like. Um, we're going to probably end up, when we do that, not having plants that are prolific in production, i.e. the amount of crops we're going to get the yield is going to go down based on that. There's no question that with open pollinated uh, seeds that you are not going to get the same production. Um, it's also that important that we begin preserving some of our minor crops uh, 
traits uh, so that we have them for the future if we need them. Some of the other vegetables that we have, some of the other varieties of corn, soybeans, those types of things. Um, and we have to look at livestock breeds too because 43% of them, that's close to half, that are threatened with extinction. And we need to have that variety, so perhaps we need to look at how we can keep them from becoming extinct. Um, here's an example of a lot of farmers are um, doing things to become conservationists. One way in which they can do that, there's many ways, but one way they can do it, this farmer has a birdhouse, he's just checking to see if it needs cleaned out or if there's anything that was in there, evidence of any birds that were in there. But birds uh, can be pollinators, so that's one way in which you can uh, they can get, remove pests. Um, so each just put birdhouses out that'll help bring them to the area, have a place where it's bad weather for them to stay. Um, and then in conclusion, um, we need to come up with plant and livestock pro programs um, that include that horizontal resistance. In other words, we're going to look at all the different qualities we have and how can we make each of them better. Um, we need to have a reduced uh, dependence on human interventions, in other words, modifying our soil, putting all the pesticides and herbicides and um, fertilizers on the field. We need to find ways in which we can get our land better and modify it without using those synthetic inputs. Uh, and then we have to try to introduce mechanisms uh, in plants and livestock breeds that will help provide resistance in ways that aren't going to be harmful for the users of those uh, plants or animals. And here is the attributions for the second portion of Unit 10.